I'm on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, running the game under HDR, and I'm going to talk about the HDR performance of the monitor. So this monitor is Display HDR 1000 certified, which is actually an incredibly high level for a budget monitor. A key part of this is the use of the 336 dimming zone FALD full array local dimming backlight solution, so-called mini LED backlight solution, and the ability of the monitor to pump out high brightness at the same time as some shades appearing much dimmer. So just focusing in on the brightness now, let's look at some numbers. So if you're not familiar, this test has a white square in the middle of the screen and it's surrounded by black. And that square has a patch size or a percentage window of 1%, which means it's covering 1% of the pixels of the screen, 4%, 9%, 25%, 49%, or 100%. 100% 100 white means the entire screen is white and therefore there is no black surrounding it and therefore contrast can't be measured there. Some of the values here have a less than sign, some a greater than sign. The reason for that is again, like I mentioned in the full review when I was talking about contrast with SDR, it's because of the precision of the calibration instrument and there's a huge difference between 0.01 and 0.02 and there's rounding and all of that. So I'm just being a little bit careful, I'm not trying to pretend that some of these are exact or precise figures. But when you look at the brightness, you've got a peak brightness recorded of 1,374 nits, and that's for 100% white. For 1% white, that was the lowest reading, and that was 633 nits. The reason for that is because of dark biasing. So you've got 336 dimming zones, you've got white surrounded by black in this test. The monitor isn't just going to pump out that little white square, 1% white being the smallest white square used in this test, when it's surrounded by black. So it's actually going to dim that white, as you can see from these figures. But either way, this is an impressive performance, especially when you look at the 4% window size and above. And again, you can see the contrast advantage. So it's able to maintain less than 0.01 nits for the black, except for with a 25% window where it's less than 0.02. Then for 49% white, it was 0.06. So remember that the black reading is taken offset to the right, with the colorimeter offset to the right of the white square, equidistant between the monitor bezel and the edge of the white square. So if you've got a 49% white square, that's a very large white square, really a relatively small black area to measure. So it's sort of close enough to that white that it's lifting the luminance up of the black a little bit, which is why it's 0.06. Anyway, don't want to obsess too much about these figures, just to show you that it is a very effective local dimming solution. It gives you a nice brightness level. I've given you a few at the bottom here, taken with the local dimming solution set to medium and low, just so you can compare with high. But as I showed you in the full review with respect to SDR, there's really more to this dimming solution than just looking at pure black and pure white. And these figures really only show part of the story. But even so, you can see that with the low setting, the contrast is simply lower than with the medium setting. And the medium setting is lower than with the high setting. And for this particular comparison, it's with a 4% white window. To give you a bit of context, I'm comparing here with a QD OLED. This is a typical QD OLED performance, the Dell Anima AW3423DW. And you can see that with the QD OLED, because it's got per pixel illumination, it doesn't have the issue with dark biasing for smaller bright elements. Even if they're surrounded by pure black, it can show them with very high brightness. However, it has an ABL automatic brightness limiter, which means that when bright shades dominate, it dims. Whereas for the AOC, there's no such issue. It can very happily pump out very high brightnesses when bright shades dominate. It is worth being aware though. So the 100% brightness reading here, this is a sustained brightness reading. It was taken 30% after the shade was displayed. But actually the brightness of the display does decline over time under HDR in certain conditions. Specifically, if the monitor is displaying full screen white, which demands the maximum brightness for a few minutes, then the luminance can fall a bit to below a thousand nits. The brightness for smaller bright elements would also decrease temporarily, and this is to prevent overheating. The monitor is passively cooled, there's no fan, so the decrease in brightness is a countermeasure to stop it overheating, and it will increase again once the monitor cools down sufficiently. For example, of mixed contents presented for a while. I didn't observe this triggering when gaming under HDR, but if you're in a particularly warm room or you've been using HDR for a while, especially with a lot of bright dominant content, then it could potentially trigger. But it's not like the screen suddenly becomes dim when it does trigger, it's just that the brightest elements will be somewhat dimmer. 
So in terms of how things are set up under HDR, that is covered in the best settings video. But to give you a super quick reminder, you can't really control a lot under HDR. It might not be clear in the video, but pretty much everything's grayed out except for the HDR setting. But you really want to set that to display HDR because anything else can inappropriately oversaturate the image, but it also has this, in my opinion, nasty looking sharpness filter. So when I'm looking at the foliage in the background, it looks really artificially over sharpened with anything other than the display HDR setting. And not to mention it looks completely oversaturated with most of the other HDR settings. Local dimming is the other setting of interest. I would just set this to strong. It's the most dynamic setting. You get the most out of the monitor that way. Set to medium. It's not dimming as well for the darkest shade. So there's an uplift there, which makes it look less impressive than it should really. A further uplift for low. And again, that's a bad thing for these particular shades. And as for off, well, things just look completely flooded and even the bright to medium shades look much brighter than they should and look quite sort of faded in a way. So yes, I definitely would recommend the strong setting. And the shadow details here, so they're not like you'd get on an OLED for this kind of scene where you'd get the shadows really deep, really dark, and the slightly lighter shades next to them would be just a little bit brighter but still really very deep. You just don't get that level of precision with 336 dimming zones. Having said that, the overall look to the scene, it's good. You know, I've just shown you what it looks like with local dimming off. And as it happens, I do have a little crosshair on the screen at the moment that's built into the monitor. I didn't actually mean to have that. I just accidentally pressed the button. I do that quite often on this monitor, actually. I find that a bit annoying. It's the third button along. If you press that when you're not in the main menu system, then it puts on this little crosshair. But it's useful in a way because it helps me highlight a little bit about haloing or blooming. You've got 336 dimming zones. For some situations, there is a bit of haloing. So I've got this bright crosshair and directly surrounding that dark shades. And it does lift the dark shades up a bit. Actually, a lot more subtle than you might expect if you just think of 336 dimming zones. Part of that is because of the panel itself has natively strong contrast as a VA panel with a good 4000 to 1 plus native contrast ratio. So that does help. And also the, the local dimming solution is really quite well tuned to not excessively bright bias when smaller bright elements are on the screen. So, for example, when I was showing you the readings for 1% white, that's why they were significantly dimmer than the peak that the monitor was capable of. A master monitor is able to maintain good depth for these darker to medium dark shades. The bright shades here, nice and bright, about as bright as I've seen this actually. It isn't the maximum of the monitor, the monitor's not trying to do that here. This is just natural daylight streaming in. And there's definitely excellent contrast between the darker shades and the brighter shades. Another advantage with HDR, you get excellent tone mapping precision. So you don't have to worry about the kind of imbalances I talked about under SDR when you were using local dimming, where some things are obviously over brightened and can look flooded. And darker shades can appear really kind of crushed together depending on the brightness setting you're using. You don't have to worry about the brightness setting, it's all set automatically. And actually the detail of the darker shades is improved compared to SDR. There's an enhanced nuanced shade variety, you can use 10-bit colour reproduction. So there's an excellent variety of closely matching dark shades. Again, per pixel illumination would improve this further. And if there wasn't any black crush at all, although as I said it wasn't an extreme issue on this model, there was a little bit of that going on. But I would say that really the overall detail levels for a mini LED solution, especially with this number of dimming zones, is actually pretty impressive. I think it's really quite well balanced overall. Jumping into the water now, as I love to do, there's a definite eye-catching look to the bright glint on the water there. I measured 854 nits for this shade, although it does depend how big the shade is. So that's really when it's bigger, when it blooms out, that's the reading. But it was actually sometimes below 500 nits when it was a bit smaller. And that's really mainly because of the dark biasing going on, because it's surrounded by shades which aren't super bright. The representation of these darker and the medium shades, pretty good, good depth to them. It's able to show those brighter shades at the same time as the darker shades because of the local dimming solution, works well. Again, not supreme precision, so the depth of the very dark shades and, and some of the medium shades. It's not as good as it could be. It's not as good as it would be on an OLED, but it's still pretty good. Speaking of OLED, I know that's a bizarre comparison to make because this is a budget monitor, but even so, I do still like to talk about this scene with OLEDs. It is more impressive on OLEDs. It's more atmospheric in general, and there's just a greater variety of shade brightnesses. 
the limitation with the number of dimming zones is quite apparent in this kind of scene because there's sort of a, a pulling up of some of the little shadow details because of the somewhat brighter medium shades surrounding those little shadow details. And there just isn't the precision here with 336 dimming zones to present this properly. Although actually on some mini LED solutions I've seen they kind of go too far the other way and they start dark biasing really heavily even for scenes like this and that will crush the detail far too much and that can be really annoying actually. And certainly the look of the nice glint here, nice and bright, and again the surrounding shades, it's not the same contrast you can get on models with a much greater number of dimming zones, but it's still pretty good. And it is vastly superior to what you would get on your typical LCD monitor under HDR, which might be a bit more like that. I've just turned the local dimming solution off. Things look really flooded and cloudy and nasty now. This is another scene where the precision of OLEDs is very good because there are some rather small bright elements interspersed with much darker surroundings. Sort of, the, you know, the atmosphere in general on this scene, it's not quite as good as it could be. And I can see some halos around the bright elements. There's also a kind of shifting of the halos. It's kind of can sometimes look a little bit like a flickering effect, although it's not too strong in this case. If you're sensitive to that kind of thing, you might not find it too distracting here, but you can see it quite clearly. Um, you certainly see those little moving halos where there are fireworks in the sky, or there are little embers falling. You can see they have halos around them. But I'd say the shift in brightness of this versus the sky isn't as pronounced as I've seen on some IPS models with mini LED solutions, where they're really aggressive and it really does look like an obvious flickering here. I wouldn't really describe it as an obvious flickering, but it's just something to be aware of if you're sensitive to that kind of thing. If you tone the local dimming down to medium, and moreover to low, then the depth of those medium shades is brought up a lot. You can still see the halos, but there's less of a contrast between the sky, because it's brighter, or brighter than it should be, and the halo around the bright objects. So perhaps for some scenes you may prefer to lower the local dimming solution if you're particularly sensitive to flickering, but the overall atmosphere is much worse now, so I would just stick to strong if you can. As I will be. And these halos as well, they would be stronger around the lights here in the background for example, and the blue lights on the post there, for example, they should actually be brighter than they are, but there is some dark biasing going on. If it was bright biasing here, then the halos would be much more noticeable as well. So I think it, again, I really do think the balance that they've struck here with the number of dimming zones they've got is actually very good. And now on Battlefield 5, just for a little bit of variety, I'm running the game under HDR. Now this scene here is one that OLED monitors struggle with under HDR because there is a sufficient amount of bright shade that the ABL, Automatic Brightness Limiter, kicks in. But this monitor has no such issue. It is able to display the bright shades here very nicely. So the sun there, I measured 809 nits. So that is really impressive, actually, for this particular element. And there's just a generally nice bright look to the sky and the silver lining around the sky and the glint of light down there on the ice as well. Just the overall scene, it just has a nice natural daylight quality to it, which I think is really nice. So if you consider the peak brightness there of the sun, on an OLED you'd actually be lucky to see even half of that because of the ABL. So yes, I definitely do like the representation of this scene on this monitor. It isn't as, you know, as impressive as I've seen it on any monitor. The ASUS PG32UQX, that monitor is display HDR1400 certified and it's able to pump out amazing peak luminance. And I didn't actually record this specific element with my colorimeter, but just by eye and how I remember this scene looking and just the observations I made, you know, it was even brighter than you can see here. But I do not look at the scene on this monitor and think it's lacking in brightness. And obviously there's a huge gulf in price difference between this monitor and that ASUS. I'm now going to focus on the other side of HDR, and that's colour reproduction. Back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider. So just as a reminder, this monitor's colour gamut, I recorded 95% of the DCI P3 colour space being covered, and there's a little bit of overextension for some green shades. 
So under HDR, the game developers can have wider colour gamuts in mind, such as DCI-P3 and ultimately REC 2020, a very large colour space. So it's different to SDR, where sRGB is the common target that developers have in mind, and if you're using a wider gamut than that on the monitor, then you just see oversaturation and extra vibrancy. So things are more toned down when you look at, for example, Lara's skin tone, and some of the overdone greens, some of the yellowish greens were far too strong under SDR. They're nicely toned down here, but they still look lush. They still look quite lush and, and vibrant, but you know, in a more appropriate way, and there's lots of good variety as well. As I explored under SDR, yes, there are some colour consistency issues, but relatively minor for a VA panel. So that is to say that there is some loss of saturation peripherally. So if I compare this rather vibrant red looking shade here in the centre of the screen and compare that to how it looks peripherally, there's a difference. Difficult to capture on the video, but I did show you various examples earlier in the full review. Similar kind of thing under HDR. But really the overall representation I feel is pretty vibrant and given the fairly generous colour gamut, the panel technology and the tuning which is done under HDR, I do feel that things are pretty vibrant overall. And again the local dimming solution just helps give an edge in depth to some of these medium to darker shades as well, which helps them look as they should rather than looking kind of washed out as they can be on a monitor with a much weaker number of dimming zones or no local dimming at all. So overall, I can confidently say with this monitor that it's by far the most engaging and dynamic HDR experience I've had on a budget monitor. It also gave me an excuse to finally play through the Modern Warfare 3 campaign, which I've been putting off for a while. You know, I've tested various OLED monitors as well, and they would have been really nice to use in, on that campaign. But I just wanted something a little bit different, and I decided this would be the monitor I'd use to play through the campaign. And I did really enjoy it overall. I think it really did justice to the HDR on that campaign.